Recording has started. Hey everyone, uh, this is Claire Development uh, Community Meeting for April 6th. Uh, we have a couple things on the agenda, uh, a few presenters. Uh, I'm going to open this up by going over some of the tickets that were brought up um, in our last community meeting. Um, so we have this filter now, it's actually public. And if you were to go to our community meeting agenda, scroll up a little bit, we're going to monitor action items in our upstream issues.redhat. So things come up during the community meeting um, and we want to track them. These are also really great tickets for anyone that is watching and wants to begin contributing to Claire. Don't, if you don't really know where to start, coming to this link here and taking a uh, look at these issues, they're great places to kind of jump onto. Um, so we had a couple things come up last meeting. Uh, we wanted to look into distro support in CentOS. Um, not, there hasn't been much movement on that. Um, our team at Red Hat is currently a little busy since we're packaging up a Quay 3.5 release. Um, so a lot of these things we didn't touch yet, but I'm just going to review them just in case it piques anyone's interest. Um, so CentOS support is still on the table. Trill's trying to understand if there is a upstream security database and whether we can actually um, link vulnerability data with confidence between the RHEL databases and um, CentOS uh, package databases in a CentOS image. So I think we need to either do a little bit of research on that or just reach out to CentOS teams how to get more information. Um, support distro list containers. Um, Hank and I uh, threw this around in the Claire collaboration chat with a couple people from Stack Rocks as well. It seems feasible. Um, I made a comment in this ticket that if distro list containers are actually append only and stay append only, we could possibly support it today. Um, with the caveat that if they do start actually mutating um, any of the per package databases, we'll probably we'll miss some things without um, a re-architecture, uh, you know, without a look at how to support that better. Uh, this is an interesting tick up, uh, ticket that uh, Yvonne brought up from uh, customer engineering. And this will be prioritized. This is basically having Quay UI inform the client um, when a container being scanned isn't supported by Claire. It's just a usability thing, but I, I think it's important. Um, right, I think after we finish up the Quay 3.5 release, this is going to become prioritized. Um, so clients will be able to understand whether Claire is saying, hey, I don't know what this image is, or if it's saying, um, your image is fine. It's okay. It's scanned and, and nothing uh, was present in it. Integration testing. I <laughs> came up against the wall with this because the way we are doing um, Claire initialization, we moved it to non-blocking. So Claire doesn't wait for all the data to be there. Um, actually, it makes this testing a little bit harder. Uh, so I'm going to punt on this for just a little bit until me and Hank... Um, probably collaborate on yet another brain uh, brainstorming session on how initialization should work. And then implement granular health check. It's just still on the back burner. It's also a very good community ticket just because it's not extremely difficult to dive into and can be sectioned out from the rest of the code pretty easily. Um, so yeah, those are the tickets that are in play as far as uh, action items for the community meetings. Um, let's start looking at agenda items. Uh, so Hank, it looks like you have a couple items here to, uh, to kick off with. So if you want to just go ahead and take over. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the first thing is talking about rate limiting. Um, so we've, I don't know, uh, if anyone's actually tried to run Claire they'll hit some rate limits when talking to uh, trying to fetch Red Hat databases. And we've talked to the um, IT department internally and they're unwilling or unable to change the way that works. So we're just going to implement a rate limiter globally. Um, it'll just 
the plan is to have Claire um, just do a rate limited 10 requests per second to a given host. That's just what it's going to be. So it'll slow, it'll slow um, like the, the Red Hat requester down. Just about everything else should be unaffected because we're not making as many requests or we're making a smaller bounded set of requests. Um, but that's that's basically the only change is the per host limit. Everything will still run in parallel. And um, like when the Red Hat updaters start running, they'll just sort of sit in the pipeline until they get their token to go do the request. Um, so and then quick as, question. Yeah. With, with that rate limiting, uh, where do we expect to actually block? Where are we sitting while we're being rate limited? Right on the client.do call? Yeah. Yeah. In, okay. in the fetching, in the updater. Okay, cool. So that would just hang out until, is there a CTX driven? Is it still CTX driven? It's just. Yeah. Like uh, all the cancellation and everything works exactly the same. Okay. There's no, there's no magic. It's um, the change in Claire is, or the, the rate limiter is in Claire. Uh, it's not wired up to anything because of the, well, I'll get to it in my next items mm -hmm. because uh, I need to go do some wiring in Claire core, mm -hmm. but the rate limiter is there. It's very easy. It just uses a, um, just a token bucket pulls it. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. uh, yeah, waits waits for it to be able to get it, so the context cancellation plums through everything. Should be should be pretty simple. Um, okay, the configuration rework. Um, so as a part of this, one one component of this is if we're going to use like a rate limiter. Obviously, we need to make sure everything is using the rate limiter, as in it's using the configured uh, client that's going to honor it. So part of the Claire core changes of this is I went back through, and previously we were only calling configuration methods if the user had passed some sort of configuration object in, and now it gets called unconditionally if it exists with just a, um, and the like configuration mechanism just gets a no op bit for that. Um, so there is a PR against Claire core that does all this for all of the, all of the entry updaters work like this now um, and uh, support being called like that now. So that work uh, so, is done. I ran it for a couple hours yesterday, just sort of sitting there. And uh, with a, I modified a, the like testing binary to uh, just have the default transport, just return errors. So I like configured an HTTP client and then went and set the defaults on the, net HTTP package to just return errors anytime that got called mm -hmm. and just let it sit there and it ran fine. Everything was actually using it to make their network requests. So that's promising. Gotcha. One thing I have a question about is do all updaters now require to have a configurable method on them? Even uh, if it's a block. They don't require it currently, but I mean, they maybe should. Okay. We can follow that same, like, no, op, like embed a no op thing that I was doing in the metrics or the, uh, enrichment specification. If you want to follow the same pattern, it might just be nice because then it just looks like, okay, if you need to do something that's more like under the covers that you don't care about, just embed this thing. I just follow that from now gRPC. If you like, 
if you are implementing like clients or servers, they just have this little embed thing that makes sure like, okay, this fulfills this interface. So I'm just stealing that pattern from them, which I thought was kind of neat because it's just very out of the way. Yeah. I mean, the, the useful bit of the configure um, interface, the way we've got it set up is that that provides the HTTP client. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to implement it yourself sort of no matter what, but I guess we could make a D like a, an easy to use one that just captures that. Use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You could think about that, but uh, yeah, I think I, I, I'm pretty sure I have my head wrapped around what you're doing. So yeah, yeah you're just basically. Maybe... Sorry. I think we might want to migrate that interface to make it not optional. Mm -hmm. The configure interface, right? At the updater interface to make the mandate that that configure method yes the configure method on the update on the updater it should become required basically yeah because right now it's just you can opt in into implementing this extra interface and then it'll get called and everything in tree does that and we don't have any out of tree ones so we yeah. should be able to just make that change pretty easily. Yeah, no, I think I'm in agreement with that. So let me make a note. Uh, let's actually make that a note for this. Yeah. Um, but as part of this, I, uh, this, I made the same change for scanners and the updater factories. So if they have their, if they have their configuration methods, those get called no matter what. So would you say make the configure method uh, mandatory for all of those, updater, scanners, and factories? Uh, yeah, probably. Okay. Because, I mean, okay, it's, cool. it's pretty trivial to stub it out if you don't yeah. actually use it. Exactly. And if you do use it, it's sort of a key bit of everything. Yeah, so if they don't use it right now, will we panic? Because uh, the default, the non-default, uh, well, the default HTTP client is being used? No. Uh, okay. I mean, the like messing with the package level defaults is, I don't know. I don't know if we want to do that, but mm -hmm. I just did no, it for testing thought... because it's very easy to figure out if something was gotcha. gonna going to do it. Oh. So that's how you did it for testing. You basically poisoned the default. And then if it was used, it panicked. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that's why when we were talking in Slack, I was like, are you going to upstream that? But I guess the you wouldn't, right? Because you are poisoning the default. Probably not, yeah. Okay. I, cool. I mean, kind I added of a flag it. into the, the test binary so you can re... Yeah. Like... Yeah, that totally makes sense. But yeah, we wouldn't do that in prod. That's why I was kind of in a... Had a question mark around that. All right, cool. That all sounds good. Yeah. Um, and then so as part of this work, digging into this, uh, it sort of also bled into some work with the air gap stuff. Um, so I ended up doing some reworking of the rel updater and scanner. Um, so that might need a little more scrutiny uh, from mm -hmm people that care about it, which I guess is all of us. Um, but yeah, so it's sort of, the idea is to cut down on the number of like side channels that the rel updater is doing. It was like spawning, it was doing some, like a little bit of code smell stuff. Uh, so that's more in line now. Um, and cool. then I had an idea about how we could maybe do better import and export for the air gap support with SQLite. But that would involve like pulling in SQLite as a dependency. So I don't know if we want to do that. Or, and then trying to have to explain that you really shouldn't use it for anything except this one specific thing. Yeah, I mean, I align with the interest in SQLite mostly for a offline indexer, you know, no yeah. database required. So. I'm not opposed to at least exploring 
opportunities to bring SQLite in. Uh, we'll just have to leave the options because right now, even our scratch binaries will like do C go no, you know, C go no. disabled. That yeah. goes away. We can't do so that. I guess anymore. We, we could try to use that pure Go implementation of SQLite, see if that works, that fits our use cases. Yeah, I mean, that might be where we want to start. I looked yeah. at that. I didn't really see how to like initialize a database with that. So I think you still need the SQLite tooling like on the node on the container, inside the container, because it won't create the file type for you. I think, I haven't looked that hard. Yeah, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, my right. my concern is mostly, I think if we were to, we could make, so the way the offline export works right now is it just dumps everything it finds, file, every time. Um, I think if we had the, the SQLite, it could maybe look at an old, you could tell it to look at an old version and then it could do the, um, like use the fingerprinting mechanism instead of just starting from a blank slate every single time, which might be yes. of interest. Yeah, it could be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's all I've got. Cool. All right, so I have a couple things, uh, more just informational. Um, database metrics are now in uh, actually this 4.1 alpha build, which I'll, I'll touch upon a little bit more in just a second, but, um, yeah, we basically are now exporting all database duration, uh, query durations and just counts so you can see their rates. And if you are interested in, uh, finding out a little bit more about how we expose those, um, again, we keep, uh, most our uh, open designs in GitHub discussions in this design tab. So here's our Claire and Claire core metric pass one. And um, basically if you come down to here, the general API, general database, this part of the specification has been implemented. So at this time you can basically Go to uh, Prometheus, explore metrics, anything starting with Claire Core. I do have to make a small amendment. Uh, this only covers uh, database metrics in Claire Core. Um, there are database metrics in Claire because we uh, developed the notifier service inside the Claire repository. So I just need to basically amend this just a bit and add the fact that there are database metrics which start with just Claire. They follow the same naming convention though. So it's Claire Core, the store name, which happens to be like indexer, notifier, or vuln store, uh, where we keep the vulnerabilities, then the database function, and then a uh, name as a moniker saying, okay, totals, this is a Prometheus, um, more of a Prometheus idiom. Uh, total is, is for counters. Duration is for histograms with the unit that is being measured. Um, so if you're running Claire and you have been questioning uh, how are we doing as far as query optimization, um, you can now actually pick those details out. So if you guys uh, watching this or currently at the meeting actually want to start looking at this stuff, uh, you can definitely start submitting tickets about you know query lengths, durations. We'll take a look at them. Um, and just make sure that we're doing a good job at optimizing SQL on our end. Um, but I'll be doing that work myself. Obviously, there's just a couple things going on at the same time, so I haven't been able to sit with that yet. Um, but it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice community to ask to say, like, because performance affects everyone involved with the application. So, um, so those are in. The enrichment work is about to kick off. Um, so you know what. Uh, let me show another link. There is github.com quay player enrichment spec. Um, and this is our in, uh, specification for enrichment. Um, if you watched the previous meetings, then you'd know enrichment is our way of bringing back uh, NBD metadata and other types of auxiliary um, information to the vulnerability report. So for instance, um, if we wanted to bring in uh, Red Hat uh, grading scores, we can now do that and, and place it into the vulnerability report 
um, and then clients can use that extra metadata basically to um, supplement the data that's there. So if you look at this link with the um, markdown files, there's, there's two uh, ones of interest. There's a specification which goes over how we're actually going to implement this, uh, this new metadata. Uh, we're calling it uh, enrichment specification. And then more recently, there is the implementation details with the nitty gritty of, of how this is going to happen. So this week, I'm gonna start on this work. You can track this work at issues.redhat.com. Um, it will actually be in our public board. We'll send a link to that in a bit. I also think that it's on the agenda. Um, but we'll be tracking the work for uh, care enrichments, and that'll be kicking off this week. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, if you are missing severity details and it's really um, um, affecting your use cases with Claire, um, just watch that. Um, work happening in issues.redhat.com. I will, at the end of this meeting, actually put a link there if you are interested. You can track it and then you'll know as soon as we get um, auxiliary data back into the vulnerability support, you'll be able to use it once again. Um, and then this completed as of yesterday, there's a 4.1 alpha build. So 4.1 is going to be a pretty big release. I mean, we're going to have a ton of reliability fixes, this enrichment metadata coming out, so we split the release a little bit. Um, 4.1 now has, um, 4.1 Alpha 1 is released upstream. You can go and grab it um, from the Docker repositories. All that information is at the repository, uh, the Claire repository. But it has um, particular releases as far as we no longer block in Claire uh, to come up and running. We don't wait for initialized data. Um, Notifier is more efficient now. Uh, this actually touches upon some of the things you brought up, Jan. So we've uh, kind of got all those changes into there. Um, there's also what Jan is going to cover next. So I'll just wait and defer to him to actually say it's now in the uh, 4.1 alpha build. And just a couple other reliability bug fixes, doc changes. So if you are interested in that, you can actually just look at our change log um, on the Claire repository and the Claire core repository. So, yeah, that's all I got. So, Jan, if you want to go ahead and take over with your uh, item. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jan, and uh, I'm uh, taking care of Red Hat deployment of Claire. And I will try to share my screen, if that's okay with you, Luis. Yeah, definitely. Let me stop sharing. Okay, do you see my browser? Yep. Okay, cool. So uh, as part of the release that Luis uh, was talking about just a little while ago, I also implemented a change that's related to uh, oval data published by um, Red Hat. So if you don't know what oval is, uh, you can uh, check out at their site. I, I won't go into depth. I'll just say that it's some kind of open standard uh, describing how to track vulnerabilities. And Red Hat is producing a stream of data that conforms to this standard. By the way, all of the um, things you see here, all of the web pages I'm visiting, are also in the agenda document, so you can go over them if you are interested. So uh, now specifically to Red Hat Oval, uh, this is a simple directory which looks like this. You have information for RL5 through 8, and then if you uh, go deeper into the hierarchy, you can see there are streams for specific products. So for example, Ansible 2.9. Uh, I won't be opening those because these are archives. You need to download them and extract them. So we won't lose time with that. Uh, I will just show you how a typical vulnerability looks like. 
in the overall data stream. So this is basically a definition of one vulnerability. In one stream, there are a lot of them. Uh, so, uh, and they look basically like this one. So uh, what is important here is that um, if you take a look at the class, you can see that the class is patch, and that means uh, a fix has already been released. And it's also visible here in that in that ID that there is a Red Hat security advisory tied to this vulnerability. So specifically this advisory, at this link you can see more details. Uh, here we have some human readable description, some other data. I won't go over all of them. What is important though is this affected CPE list. So this uh, basically identifies, each item identifies a repository. Uh, you, you can see, for example, AppStream here. Mm -hmm. If a record in Oval doesn't have this affected CPE list, then Claire uh, doesn't care about it. So that, 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 that's important information for what I'm about to say. But uh, for this vulnerability, we have affected CPE list, uh, so we process this. Okay, so now about my change. Apart from those vulnerabilities of class patch, we also have vulnerabilities uh, with class vulnerability. And there are two types of them. First one is unfixed vulnerability, and that basically means a security, um, security problem that has been identified but has not been fixed yet. As you can see, there is no security advisory um, related to this. And again, in the ID, we don't see RHSA, we see just CVE. Another type of vulnerability is unaffected vulnerability, as you can see here. This is actually a very strange uh, item, as this is basically just the confirmation that given vulnerability doesn't affect this package. And you can see that there are some criteria for the vulnerability to match, an unaffected vulnerability has uh, criteria structured in such a way that they will never evaluate to true. You can, you can see that XNIO is installed and is not installed, must be true at the same time. And as you can surely understa understand, that will never happen. So, uh, these two kinds of vulnerabilities have been around for a while, but in the, in the near future, Red Hat Platform Security Team is going to release OVAL files that will also associate them with affected CPE list. And from that point, Clareware will start to process those. So, uh, for us uh, to be prepared for this change, uh, we need to do two things. And basically, the intent of, the, of those changes is to take those unaffected vulnerabilities and discard them as soon as we encounter them, because we really have no way of using them. They don't bring us any value. Uh, from the point of security vulnerability scanning. So as soon as we uh, encounter them, we just discard them and we go on. We don't even create the entry in a vuln store. On the other hand, uh, with unfixed vulnerability, uh, we want to create uh, such entry and we want uh, the vulnerability 
to be seen in vulnerability report. So uh, this is uh, actually the point of my two pull requests. Uh, you can you can go over them. They are they are linked um, in the in the ag agenda. This was just let's say high level overview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is is that okay, Luis, or should I go more into depth with this? Uh, I mean, I I think I understand what you did and why you did it. So basically, I mean, the straightforward answer is just that those unaffected vulnerabilities are are a a pointer for something on the Red Hat side, but doesn't really mean anything to Claire. We would just yes. not we would a, we would actually accidentally match them, right? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. But I, I mean, mean this... we would we would uh, we would uh, process them, and in the end, when criteria are processed, we would find out that uh, they actually do not resolve to true, do not evaluate to true. But that would be a lot of time spent on nothing, basically. Yeah, totally, totally makes sense. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, the change makes sense, and I'm for it. Um, it it is it does beg the question about the usability of those things in the vulnerability database, but um you know I think that's it just might not be usable for us, but it's usable for Red Hat somewhere, you know. I guess so. I I, I suppose. Sorry, sorry go ahead. No no no. I I just suppose there is some historical reason for that, and somebody parses it in their own way. I just don't see a way for us to use it. Yeah. Yeah, it's annoying that they're making aff affected effectively mean like inflammable. <laughs> like it means it it affects it, and it also means it does not affect it. <laughs> yeah. It's it's quite the oval hack. It's like yeah, <laughs> just make an impossible condition. But uh. I mean, it touches upon the fact that I think at some point, I think in Claire, you know, V5 or something, we should start considering those oval trees, conditional trees. It's a different architecture though, because to do that, we literally, we need to understand the entire contents of the container, build the trees, and then have the full contents when we go to the match. I mean, the the original plan was to consider those trees because you can run logical transformations to turn them into just satisfiable conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a little bit of a different architecture because right now, you know, we decompose the report into streams. So we wouldn't be able to do that anymore because to consider those trees, you need the full report. You need to know what the distribution is, what's actually installed. You need more than just, hey, this is a package record. Does it match this old? Right, but only only for some types of those trees, which are not uh, common. So, like yeah. there are there are um, there are oval like criterion, which are like file exists, file contains. Mm -hmm. But those don't seem to get used very much by distribution vendors. Like I don't think Red Hat uses them at all. All all of their rules are written in terms of this package is installed and signed by this key sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I mean when I, I think if I'm not mistaken, like the Ubuntu databases, they might actually be like it's running this distribution and this package is installed and it has this version X or something like that. And then yeah. you'd have to compile that all together, which, yeah, I mean, if we support it, we should probably support, we'd have to basically grok through the databases we know at least to get an idea of what conditions are in those trees. And then it'd just be, you know, like, uh, um, evaluation period when someone wants to onboard a new distribution or security database we'll just have to ask them like hey what's your conditions what are the possible conditions and do we support that 
Yeah, I think the like weird like inspect the state of the OS like conditions are more used by the feeds published by ISVs, which we don't care about as much. So, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit ways off, but it's nice to keep it in focus because I think, yeah. you know, it's also interesting because Claire has to play nice in a world where it's not just oval either. So it's like, that's kind of, I, I think, a reason why we didn't immediately take that effort because it's like, yeah, we support oval, but we want to support other things too. So digging a whole bunch of time in the oval didn't make sense right now, but eventually it will, you know, eventually we'll be able to tool it out that far. Yeah. Cool. I also so, eventually yeah. want to do, sorry, just, Go on. sorry, just rambling. I also want to do eventually uh, actual like CPE matching for real. Um, yeah. We should so have a sync up. Thing to embase, or, we should uh, have a sync up with uh, Stack Rocks because they currently do that. So it might be that we can just kind of take how they're doing it and massage it into Claire V4. Um, yeah, I mean, they when it comes up every time, everyone cringes in the room. So I don't know how well it works. Um, yeah, but it's at least at least they have something working. I don't think you know. We, there's CPEs involved with, with the rel stuff, but I don't think it's actually CPE matching. It's just like, uh, yeah, it's identifying it's, tokens don't, that match. Don't get me, don't get me started on how product security is using it. <laughs> Very dumb. Anyway. All right, cool. So, uh, Diane Mueller added an item here for deep dive on indexing. This is a talk I was planning on doing, uh, at some point which looks like it'll be either April 19th or 26th. We'll probably put on a new OpenShift Commons that does a deep dive on the indexer, shows um, how basically it's implemented as a finite state machine, how content addressability works, and um, basically its functionality, and, and try to do as, as low level as we can get, try to explain the data model, everything like that, because it just can help you learn the application a little bit more. Um, so that's all the agenda item. Um, let's go back to those issues for a bit because there's a couple things I want to ask about. Oh, by the way, Luis, uh, you don't share the screen. Oh, cool. Thanks. I forgot, actually. <laughs> all right. I think that was screen two. Yeah, cool. Okay, so if we go back to these issues... I am kind of optimistic about at least taking a crack at this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Hank, but I, I see this as if if these containers are append only, we can support this today. And we can support it better in the future when we do model out deletions on the file system, but we I think we can support it today. And if we can, I think we can do it pretty easily. And it just checks a box. I don't know if you have opinions there. Um, I guess, I mean, the caveat is that it's, there will be false positives. Um, but yeah. can we punt that problem saying like, okay, you have a false positive because you're not following the distro list specification? I mean, no, no, I don't think so. Because like we, we already know that people do dumb things like, install packages and then uninstall packages in the same like container ancestry mm -hmm. or in the same container in different layers in the same container and with distro list we will never see the removals because of the way it works which is basically every package gets its own file its mm -hmm. own uh like debian debian database formatted file um, and we'll never see the deletions. But per the spec, you're not supposed to delete, right? Between layers? No, there's nothing. No, there's nothing I, that I saw that says like, you don't do this. I mean, um, like for, for container best practices, you shouldn't do that. But we know people do that anyway. So gotcha. 
Gotcha. Okay. No, I was under the impression distro list containers had the mandate that between layers you would not remove those packages. You know. I mean, I think I think most of the build tools that do this uh, just like copy everything in exactly. and only create one layer. But I'm pretty sure people then like build on that and do weird things. So, gotcha. Uh, okay. I mean, we could do support. It would be it would be nice to be able to do this in a way that like flags it as beta or not ready for prime time, but we don't have any sort of like graduation mechanism. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, unless so, like. We could throw it in if we're willing to uh, field some support tickets. Yeah. But we bake that in. But yeah. Okay. I think we, we spin on it a little bit longer. I just, you know, it feels like a real minimal effort to kind of say, like, at least we have, like, like you're saying, at least we have, like, beta support for this. Don't, don't depend on that. Theoretically, in our vulnerability report, we show the package databases where um, the packages were found. So we yeah. could in some way document like, hey, if we found, you know, like Debian RPM packages outside of, or even in the directory where distro list containers uh, or packages, package databases are found, consider those results beta, you know. Yeah. So, all right, let's spin on it for, you know, we'll talk about it in chat a little bit more. I mean, I think we are kind of busy, but. Yeah, I mean, I think right the, now, yeah, for like a proof of concept of this, it would be, I think, pretty easy. Doing it correct yeah. would do more engineering work. And if we want to just do a, a proof of concept, we need like a document, we need the documentation in line, yeah. like good to go yeah. so that we're not sort of dealing with that. Yeah, 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 exactly. We could just, you know, when the support tickets come up, we can be like, okay, look, uh, well, these are distro, you know, check your results if they're distro lists then. And then we can talk that through with the Quay team proper, you know, and just be like, do we want a UI element that says this or anything like that? Um, yeah. But that's cool. Um, this, I kind of want to take on because sometimes I like digging into Quay code. It's like a nice little break from what we do on an everyday basis. I'm just waiting for it to get prioritized. I don't think anyone wants to do a merge into Quay until 3.5 is done, um, right. but it seems seems pretty easy. Um, integration testing, I'm just going to pause for now. It's Yeah, I have to figure out what we do because... I mean, I guess I hate just putting a time to sleep with some arbitrary number because it's just, especially for tests, the let's sleep to make sure that all the data is there, especially for testing because it's just going to flake. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one way to do this might be to use the air gap support. Yeah. Because yeah. then you'll be running it as an external process that you can wait on or kill if it takes too long. That's a good point. Okay. So, yeah. Let me... Never properly logged into these things. And so doing this might be a good impetus sneak in... Um, like making that mechanism more friendly with SQLite. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sort of stuff, because then we can basically keep a keep the database in the GitHub artifacts and just keep updating it as time rolls along mm -hmm. and cheat. Yeah, maybe we should, you know, I think there's a lot of usability with what we call air gap and we pigeonholed it into a very particular feature called air gap, but it seems like it can be applicable f applicable for quite a bit of things. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. So we should just consider, you know, like it, it would be a nice relook at that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say at least start POCing some of the SQLite stuff that you have in mind. If you have the free time, maybe hack and hustle, because yeah. 
yeah, I mean, I just have a lot of optimistic uh, ideas around SQLite and becoming a little bit more um, embeddable and locally ran. Cool. So this, I think we just need like, you know, a day, two days of free time to plan this out and, yeah. and get it rolling. It's just one of those things that are on the back burner. Um, yeah, the, the health check mechanism that's in there right now is like super minimal. Yeah. Um, we should probably implement like a Kubernetes style one mm -hmm. that has a little bit of programmability in it. Be very nice. If we were to do this in steps, right, what would be the very first thing we'd want to health check? I would assume database because that's a core. You can't do anything. So I think the very first thing we would want to do is the ability to namespace no per node health checks. namespace node health checks because there's a class of there's a class of health checks that is like you'll get the same result no matter which which node you talk to and then there's a class of health checks that depends on which node you talk to right i get what you're saying decipher uh shared information from local information in health checks. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can just make that like a first class citizen in, in the JSON blob, it returns some like high level key, it's like local or shared or I mean, yeah, we can like that. figure out the terminology, but cool. And then, yeah, that makes sense. So and then, then we should probably start populating the the node health checks first because those are very simple. And yeah, that'd be mm -hmm. things like database connection. Um, I don't know like how to end up in Jira. Space on the temp, like running out of temp space. So database, local storage, stuff like that. Yeah. We don't really monitor this space at all. No, but I think we could do exactly. that. I mean, we can do that entirely in the health check if we, exactly. if we implement it. Because, yeah. yeah, that could be a fun one. So we might want a health check that just kind of takes things modularly, spits out some kind of like string that we just display into a JSON message. Yeah, I would. I, I want to model it after the Kubernetes API health checks. Okay. Um, the way theirs works is if you hit the like root of that, it returns like, yeah, just a bunch of lines and either I think like a 200 if they were all okay or something else if any one of them wasn't. And then you can okay. do a query parameter to just query one of those health checks. Gotcha. See if I can find a quick example. Mm, whatever, I'll find it later. I'll put it on the ticket. But uh, yeah, sure. I'm down to model it after that. Uh, model after K8 API health checks. Okay. Database. Local storage. We don't care about like RAM and system metrics, right? It no, just comes up because so. I'm. Yeah. Uh. Okay, I'll put that for now just as a starting point. I dropped the link in the chat. Oh, great. Yeah, when you're presenting, it hides the app. I got it back. Oh, great, yeah. Cool. So you're spending, you know, the majority of your time working on the, the rate limiting stuff, right? Uh, rate limiting, the configuration. Yeah, that's winding down. So I can uh, pick on the next thing, whatever that is. Probably working on the notifier. Okay. 
All right. Well, those are the tickets. Let me see. I think the CentOS one. I don't know, man. There's. I don't. I don't think there's much to be done, especially considering Stream is even less rel like. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to talk to someone that works around those teams to see. Even if we just have like a, a brainstorming session and then come out of it saying, hey, no, it's not going to work. <laughs> you know, like I'd be happier with that, but I just need, I need to find the contacts. I haven't really. Yeah, I guess, I guess maybe we should try to follow up with the CentOS security group. Exactly. If we can get one of one of them in a meeting in our next community development meeting to talk about this with us, that would be at least a definitive answer for us. Yep. All right. So yeah, I'll add that. Let's see. I'll leave that as an updater for myself. I'll start poking around. It can't be hard for us to get those contacts. I mean, basically under our umbrella, so. Cool. Is there anything else you're thinking about? Um, the notifier work, you're talking about making it full desist. Is that what we're kind of going with? I don't know if, I don't have a specific plan, but it seems like that's what we're gonna have to do. Yeah. I mean, do you think that the efficiency work did enough? I mean, I don't know, Jan, did the changes make enough of a difference or are things still body? Well, uh, there is still this problem that uh, if you exceed the maximum number of database connections, uh, then uh, the notifications just get lost. Okay. All right. We yeah. Can. Okay. That's probably a better way to start is making sure that 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 configurations are honored everywhere, hmm. and then see yeah. if the combination of that and not uh, eating all the RAM in the universe. Uh, Make it work. Yeah. Okay. That's where I'll start on that then. And then this lock needs to go in just because it's going to get rid of all the locking connections. Right. Or connection using locks. So yeah, I should, I actually spent a little bit of time just like confirming, like I spent just hours just testing it basically. Cause I got paranoid because it's a big change and it lo it's our locks. So but it seems pretty iron proof. So I wrote tests that basically just spawn a bunch of random go routines with a random number count and just ran that thing for like hours. I didn't get any data races. didn't get anything unable to lock, no deadlocks. So I think it's cool. I looked over the code a couple of times, um, but yeah, I'll probably, now I feel a little yeah. bit more confident with it and caught up with it. I'll probably start trying to implement that stuff, but that should help with database connections at least. Yeah, um, then let's merge that into tree and switch everything over to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was I going to say? Yeah, if we do change the notifier to do more of like um, this, this stuff, I think we need a design doc just because that can get a little hairy and things are getting complex enough and the need to correctly identify how things integrate is becoming like paramount at this point. So we could definitely like collab on that, even if you want to take charge on it, if we do get to that point. Um, but yeah, I think we're both in the, technically that service should work that if you spawn more services or nodes, they can each parallelize the work of one notification of building one uh, update operations diff basically into a notification. Yeah, I, yeah, but I, I, yeah. I think, yeah, first, first steps is making it so you can 
accurately capacity plan and not have it blow your number of connections. Yeah, I would totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we're at the uh, we're at the hour. So unless you guys got anything else, we can wrap this one up and I'll do a little bit of ticketing and updating this doc with what we've covered. Cool. Jan, thanks for presenting. That was great. It's good to get uh, that information out. Yeah, thank you for organizing those meetings. It's it's really valuable. The old yeah, work. No problem. I'll see you guys on the next one. Yep. Bye. See ya.